Dragon Crew has been. This meeting is being recorded. That was me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me just move that into my other display here. Um, ever since I've been working from home, I've been working with dual displays. And I've gotten so used to it, I'm now looking into a four display computer. <laughs> I was uh, I was talking with um, Dr. Watson at U of R, and uh, he's got a, a four display setup. So two vertical, two vertical, and then two and then three across. So you have three across the bottom and then two in the middle. It's really like I've a got, command center. I've got three across, but I also just got a USB monitor. You can just now plug into USB. I travel with it, but that gives me a fourth. Plus, I usually have two iPads to watch security videos. So I'm really at six screens. <laughs> six? Okay, well, I thought know, I was joking iPads, with two. I count iPads <laughs> for doing other things, you know, so. Crazy, crazy. But you well, have these a, USB monitors you can get for as little as 120 bucks. You just plug them in and they're great yeah, for a, a second 15-inch display or something, you know. Great yeah, I've got a spare display um, that I need to give to somebody. It's a small one because I'm getting used to more and more used to the larger ones. But no, space.com right now, um, Dragon Crew is delayed due to launch, due to weather. Um, another company trying to read or orbit is called Astra. And they've got the story about the rogue black holes from the Hubble stuff. And Perseverance is giving up, is uh, gearing up to uh, try a second rock sample. The first one ne never made it into the sample bag. Perseverance actually has these little sample tubes. And what they do is they can grab a rock sample, put it inside the sample tube, and then drop it for a later mission to come along and pick it up pretty interesting to see that was that the sample that. that turned into powder uh basically that's what happened yes yeah the rock on mars is is weird um the uh lander that they had that tried to put the drill in why can't i ever remember the names of these things curiosity not curiosity oh uh, um uh, insight insight, insight. 8 p.m. So Filipenko should be talking to us at about 8.15, Mike. Yeah, yeah. So let me do this. Let me uh, let me start my presentation stuff here to kind of inform what's going on coming up, and then we'll, uh, we'll wait for Alex to come on. So, all right. So let me start in. So welcome, everybody. This is our uh, Rochester Starfest substitute, kind of an Astro weekend. And I figure what I would do is... Uh, do some announcements like I would for a normal meeting, just, just quick type announcements uh, leading into Alex's talk that's called A New Surprise in the Accelerating Expansion of the Universe. So is there anybody, this is the first time they've been on one of our calls or meetings? Yeah, this is my first time. This is Tom Tung. Glad hey, Tom. to be here. Thank you. Welcome. Glad to have you. This is kind of how we, we spent all of 2020, or at least from March 2020 until uh, May of this year. Uh, we actually used a different platform than Zoom, but we know that our speaker is much more familiar with Zoom, so that's the that's what we chose for this uh, for this event. So welcome, Tom. Thanks. Glad to be you've been, here. You've been very active using the uh, using the observatories up at the site, so that's good stuff. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to doing more. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome. Anybody, anyone else? Okay. Well, anybody want to share an observing story that they've had recently? I know that uh, Kevin Lyons at Vizan has been very busy imaging our planets and moon of late. You guys have seen those in, in the email if you're on the email list. Did a little observing last night. I went to Arizona earlier in the month and did some uh, did some uh, observing up at uh, the Lowell Observatory. They have a new 
roll off garage, the whole garage rolls back and they have six telescopes up there you can observe with. Three of them are electronically assisted. So they're basically imaging and you look at the images on monitors and the other three, you can actually look through the scopes and I gotta tell you the skies up in, uh, in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona look just like they do in the planetarium. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> you get, you have such clear portal one, two skies there that the Milky Way looks just the same. You get the, the Milky Way going across the sky. You can see the dark lane coming up through the middle visually without any assistance. It's pretty amazing. Anybody else have an observing story they want to share? Well, I've been photographing the moon and Beautiful. photographing the Milky Way. Beautiful. Beautiful objects. All right. So moving along, I want to make sure that I recognize in front of everybody Bob Easterly's contribution to the astronomy section for 22 years. He's been our treasurer. And as of the end of this year, he wants to retire from that position. And so he gave us his notice a month or so ago. And he just he deserves it. I mean, he's it's it's a it's a really important job for us, keeping track of our money, our investments, reporting monthly to the board on where we're at and what's you know, keeping a checkbook for all the money that we spend on and off. He's done a really nice job for us. And I wanted to make sure that we all thank Bob for his service. And then secondly, we need to find his replacement. And so if you or you know someone who wants to, who would you think might be qualified to do this, uh, let me know. You have my email address. You can see it as part of the invites and stuff I send out. Let me know or anyone else on the board if you're interested. And uh, we'll we'll do an interview and uh, talk to you or, 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 or whom you think might be a good treasurer to uh, replace Bob at the end of the year. But uh, huge thanks to Bob Easter. I don't know if Bob is on or not. Is Bob on? We don't know. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, so upcoming events, we have uh, observing this Saturday, uh, September 4th in the evening, dusk to whenever. It, uh, this is Labor Day weekend, I believe, but uh, we will have be able to do observing this weekend at the site. Also the next day, we will have an open house from noon to four. So feel free to drop by and get a tour of the place. We also do some work on the on the place while we're there. We have a bunch of people there. Sometimes there's lawn mowing going on or painting or you know, other activities to, uh, to maintain our site. But certainly it's a great time to get a tour of the site. If, you've, if you haven't been or, or have been, you can, uh, you can learn how to use the different observatories at the site on, uh, on an open house day. Coming up, uh, our next regular meeting is, is September 10th. Ostensibly, this will happen at RIT. We don't know yet. We were able to book the room. We did not get a confirmation yet. So uh, I put an asterisk by this because we're not sure if we're actually gonna be in there or not. More to come, as soon as we find out, you'll certainly get that announcement. But the plan right now is to meet at uh, RIT on September 10th for that meeting. And we'll see what, um, We'll see what um, what happens, what develops there, if they're going to let us meet there or not. Following that meeting, the next week, we have our board meeting on Wednesday. Uh, we'll do that at the Ferris Center. That You could do that remotely as well. If you want to join us, let me know. I'm sure glad to have you join us for the, uh, the board meeting. Every member is welcome to join us at the board meeting. And then we have one more event in, in September, one of our favorite events, and that's the Fall Festival in Ionia. So the, the uh, Hamlet of Ionia celebrates fall. The uh, Ionia United Methodist Church and the fire department get together and we put together this, um, this fall festival, which includes a tractor parade, which is a sight to see. If you haven't been there for this, there's over a hundred tractors uh, from you know the early turn of the century tractors to stuff that's, that's around now. Uh, that come through town and some, some of that old stuff is still being used. It's pretty amazing. Uh, come through town uh, in a parade along with the fire department, scouts and other community people. It's a, it's a great parade. That's at one o'clock. 
The whole event starts at 11, goes to four. We'll actually have hay rides at the festival site, which is right behind the church in Ionia. Um, and we'll have uh, tractor pulled hay rides that, that go up to our site for people to get tours of uh, our site from uh, uh, 11, I think it's 11 o'clock till about 3.30 to, uh, to tour our site. So that's another way to, have, uh, to visit our site. Oops. And this is the uh, the official poster, if you will, that uh, that's out there for it. There's other events that happen. It starts early in the morning. There used to be a pancake breakfast, but this will now be uh, be done by uh, uh, coffee and donuts in the morning. So it's a little little less interactive. Uh, there'll be food available all day. The chicken barbecue that'll go until it's sold out. Uh, the parade, as I said before, is at one o'clock. Behind the church, there's a cake wheel that you can put uh, at really cheap. I think you put a quarter down on the cake wheel. They spin the wheel and you can walk away with a whole plate of cupcakes or something. It's a lot of stuff there that's uh, on the cake wheel. It's a lot of fun to deal with. And of course, the hay rides. Uh, it looks like we're also gonna have a demonstration of a sheriff's canine unit as well. So lots of stuff happening on uh, Saturday the 18th. Um, for the RIT meeting, it's been a while since we've met here, so I put the map in here. Uh, we're, we would meet at Carlson Hall, which is near in the front of the campus, and you park in parking lot F or E are the closest ones to Carlson Hall. It's the building that's the closest to those parking lots. Pretty easy to spot us there. Um, and anybody there would help you if, you if you can't figure out exactly where that's at. So hopefully that we are meeting there in September. Yeah, Michael Richmond just told me he, he checked on the room and still no confirmation. So we're, we got our fingers crossed. If nothing happens there, we'll do this virtually. Thanks, Mike. Uh, this is our protocol when we're meeting. And, and at all times during our meeting, at, uh, at, you know, except during the regular meeting, everybody has access to the, uh, all the resources at the Ferris Center. We just ask that if, if, when there's a lot of people there, sign in. Uh, so we, if we need to do contact tracing, we know who's been around. Uh, we're strongly encouraging masking indoors. Uh, and anytime you're, you're less than six feet apart, if you're not vaccinated, you have to wear face coverings in uh, at the Ferris Center. The bathrooms are available. Just ask as you wash and sanitize your hands in the in the facility and you, what you touch in there. And there's, there's stuff in there to do that with and dispose of those wipes in the trash cans. Not, not down our septic system, please. Um, and finally, uh, the astronomy wear is in. I don't know if Tony's on. Tony, you on here somewhere? Let me see. I don't see Tony on yet. But Tony has, I think he's distributed maybe a little more than half of the astronomy section wear that uh, we've ordered. So uh, see Tony. He'll be at, uh, at one or both of the events this coming weekend to distribute that stuff. He has two boxes of stuff. I know he wants to get rid of it, doesn't want to carry it around for the rest of the year although he probably will be at this point. Uh, so come, come see Tony to get your, uh, uh, get your as res wear. And uh, thank you, Tony, for pulling it together. Tony inquired about if we had any stuff and uh, you, know, you know what happens when you ask about doing something is you usually get assigned to do it. No, just kidding. But in this case, Tony grabbed the, grabbed the reins, ran with it, did a fantastic job of uh, bringing us up to date with some uh, some cool swag. So thanks, Tony. All right. So let's talk a little bit to, to introduce our speaker. Uh, you should know a little bit about uh, what we do. We have a supernova webpage that uh, Dave Bishop started in April of 1997. And he's been keeping this thing updated nightly, daily, ever since then. How long is that, David? What is that, 24? five years, is that right? 24 years? About a quarter of a century, yeah. That's quite, a, that's quite an accomplishment. You actually got, a, you got a, a sponsorship by Purdue University to help you with that. And this, this site is a library of information for the supernova community. I mean, this is regularly referenced, updated, and it's, it is invaluable to the supernova community. And I think this is how we got our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Filipenko, is because he's one of the people that uses this 
and I did it in a flip remark to uh, to one of our meetings. I said, we need to get a speaker like Alex Filipenko to one of our things. And Dave says, you want Alex Filipenko? I know him. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> how, how great is that? And so we had a, an email conversation earlier in the year. And then uh, Dr. Filipenko agreed to uh, to talk to us. So is, is, is uh, Alex on now? I think he's yeah, on. Yeah, I'm now. here. Yes, yes uh, he is now. Fabulous. Yeah. So, so let me go to this and, and introduce you. Dr. Filipenko is a, an astrophysicist uh, at UC Berkeley. He is uh, he's the uh, Richard and Rhonda Richard and Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Professor in the Physical Sciences, a Miller Senior Fellow in the Miller Institute for Basic Research and Sciences, his research science in the University of Berkeley. But you can look at his CV and it goes on for miles and miles and miles, and we could talk about all those recognitions, but he is a, a warm and incredibly engaging speaker. And so with that, let me turn this over to uh, Dr. Filipenko. Thank you so much. Well, well, thank you, Mark, for welcoming me. And as Mark correctly noted, it's my knowledge of and friendship with David Bishop over the years that really made this possible. Um, I'm one of the people to, to whom uh, professional astrophysicists, I'm, I'm one of those many, many, many professional astrophysicists who owe a, a great debt of gratitude to David in uh, starting and maintaining this thing a quarter of a century ago. I've used it innumerable times. Uh, so thank you, David. And, and David, let me tell you that, listen, if in the next month you learn of a young nearby type 1b or 1c supernova, those are the massive stars, but ones that have stripped away their hydrogen envelope prior to exploding. So they don't look like a type two, but they look like a type one, but not the kind that comes from a white dwarf. Let me know because I have one month left in which to schedule, or, sorry, to trigger a Hubble Space Telescope um, uh, program of ultraviolet spectroscopy. And I'm, I'm becoming desperate. Last week, the Space Telescope Science Institute claimed they had something else that they needed to do. And so they didn't let me trigger on an object that I wanted to trigger on, Supernova 2021 UKT. And then I tried again this week for this week. And then they said, well, it's too old now compared to what your proposal said it would be, right? It, and I admit it's a bit old now, but, but it's still a good object. And I'm really mad at the Space Telescope Science Institute for uh, not allowing me to trigger this observation. But as a result, I have, yeah, it's a supernova, Mark. Yeah, I have one month left to trigger this observation. And so David or others, if you learn of a young nearby type 1B or 1C supernova, just let me know. Maybe I've already known about it, but, uh, but actually, maybe not. Alex, being in the place where I am, I actually find out about it before you do. Yeah, well, there you go, <laughs> right. So then, uh, yes, I can help you with that. Well, well, we only have you. one type 1C right now, but it's an old one. Yeah, it's an old one. That's the problem. And I, I notice here, I'm, I'm seeing the gallery view. Michael Richmond was a graduate student of mine a long time ago. Michael, he studied the supernova rate in starburst galaxies and also helped me set up, along with our chief engineer, Dick Treffers, uh, one of the first telescopes that looked for supernovae robotically. Uh, so I see Michael there with his with the avatar that he's used for a couple of decades now. Hi, Michael. Yeah, great to see you. I'm just looking in the chat room here. Yeah, uh, you know, this is just wonderful. Um, well, let me share my screen. All right. And um, I will share my PowerPoint thingy here. Slideshow play from start. Let's see that that, that works right. So yeah, that, that's working now. But anyway, uh, David and, and Michael, um, good to see you again and, and all of the rest of you, uh, nice to meet you. I'm sorry that your Rochester Starfest meeting, which was you know supposed to be in person, turned into a virtual one. Um, I, I feel your pain. Interestingly, UC Berkeley just started their fall semester this past Wednesday. And we're doing an experiment. We're, we're trying to do it in person. We'll see how long that lasts, actually, you know. 
but a requirement is that everyone on campus be fully vaccinated and uh, wear masks indoors. But you know, with college students going off, living in the dorms, going to parties, socializing with a bunch of people who are not necessarily vaccinated, um, we don't know how, how this experiment will work. So we might have to go back to being virtual as we've been for the past 18 months or so since March of 2020. And I'm fortunate that this semester I'm not teaching my big class. Um, I will be again in the spring and you know, maybe our situation won't be any different in the spring, but I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be in person and, um, and we'll be able to stay that way. This semester, big classes are not in person above 200 students and my class typically has 800. So I would have been virtual anyway, but I don't happen to be teaching it this semester. That's because I was gonna be traveling a lot this semester. Most of those plans got canceled. My wife and I are still holding out for the possibility of going to Antarctica at the end of November and the beginning of December to view a total solar eclipse. Um, and you know, the penguin quality colony of 100,000 penguins on South Georgia Island, and also the Falkland Islands and the West Antarctic Peninsula. So we'll see how that goes. I've got my fingers crossed. But if that trip gets canceled as well, well, then I might as well have been teaching this semester my big class the way I normally do in the fall. So uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking to such a, uh, you know, such a prominent group of, of amateur astronomers and and again, I tip my hat to David and, and many of you for being so interested in supernovae. Okay, so let me tell you about the accelerating expansion of the universe and the latest surprise, which will come near the end. Uh, and I'll, I'll have lots of time, I'm hoping for questions. I, I sort of have to leave around 9.30 your, your time because I'm actually at a different conference right now, which is remarkably enough in person, but a requirement was that everyone be vaccinated. So um, a relative, relatively uncelebrated figure in this field was Vesto Slifer, who gets very little of the credit, you know, Hubble, Edwin Hubble gets all the credit, but uh, in, um, in 1917, Vesto Slifer published a paper in which he showed that, you know, passing the light through the so-called spiral nebulae, which were not yet known to be external galaxies, but passing the light of spiral nebulae through a prism or hitting it against a grating or something, you'd get a spectrum and he recognized all of the normal spectral lines of you know, um, neutral sodium or singly ionized calcium or, or hydrogen or whatever. It was the same patterns you see in the sun or in nearby stars, but shifted toward longer wavelengths, redder wavelengths, the so-called redshift. But since Slipher, oh, and by the way, of course, Andromeda Galaxy and a few others, uh, show blue shifts, but they're in our local group. And so they're gravitationally bound to us and they're either going toward us or away from us or maybe transverse to our line of sight. So, you know, the nearby galaxies can be blue shifted, but by and large, the spectra of galaxies are red shifted. And all of you, you know, know that. But Slipher didn't have the distance of this distances of galaxies, so he couldn't do much with the red shifts. Enter Edwin Hubble, who gets all the credit, okay, and I'm not you know, minimizing what Hubble did, it's just that there were other people who did important things too, uh, but Hubble gets all the credit. He's the one who used the 100 inch Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory to take really good images of the so-called spiral nebulae, uh, including the nearest one, the Andromeda Nebula. And he was actually looking for Novi and you know, I know a bunch of you are probably looking at RS Ophiuchi these days, right? That's a recurrent nova that a few weeks ago went off and you know it's bright and really cool looking and stuff. But anyway, in, in the spiral, in the Andromeda Nebula, he was finding all these, all these novae, which he marked N. And here's a, a plate, a, a positive image of the negative I've, I've shown this image to my students in my introductory class too, and they all get confused by negatives, uh, which is what astronomers look at. So, you know, I change this into a positive so, so that bright things actually look bright and the background sky looks dark. But anyway, up here, there was one that he had marked as an N, a nova, but then he realized that in earlier plates, it was there and not much fainter, okay? Not, 
didn't brighten by a giant amount like RS Ophiuchi did. And then looking at a bunch of plates, uh, as well as some new ones that he took, he realized that it had the light curve of a Cepheid variable. And here's, you know, Delta Cephei, which I think is the, the prototypical one after, wh after which the, the class is named. And my menu bar is, is blocking that. Yeah, I, I think this is Delta Cephei. I mean, you, you guys can check up on me if it has a period of 5.37 days. But anyway, they have very well um, established light curves that rise pretty brightly, uh, pretty steeply, and then decline more slowly. Uh, and the difference among them is that they have periods of one to 100 days, okay? But they all have this basic shape. And uh, Henrietta Leavitt in 1912 examined images of the Harvard College Observatory of the large and small Magellanic clouds in the Southern hemisphere. Harvard had an observatory down there. And because each of the clouds has stars at more or less the same distance from us, you know, it's like, I don't know, the large Magellanic cloud is 170,000 light years away, and the small Magellanic cloud is 210,000 light years away. And I don't have to explain to you what a light year is, though I do in my public talks. That's like, you know, a blimp staring at the crowd at a football game way above the, the football stadium. Yes, people are at slightly different distances, but to a good first approximation they're all at the same distance. So that's the, the case for the stars in any given Magellanic cloud. And she noticed that the apparently brighter ones have these longer periods of oscillation than the apparently dimmer ones. And that the average brightness was thus correlated with the period. And because they're all at the same dif distance, um, the distance effect is is irrelevant and so the ones that are more luminous more powerful are the ones that have the longer period and this was the famous period luminosity relationship okay so this allowed one to calibrate you know these things not as standard candles i think michael might remember from when he was a student of mine i object to that term standard candle they're not all the same luminosity but they're standardizable candles or calibratable candles and I could quiz you, Michael, or look at some of your online lectures at, at RIT to see whether you use my preferred terminology of calibratable or standardizable candle. Let's see. There's something in the chat. Standardizable. Yes. There you go, Michael. Good. Yep. That was Delta Cephei. And, and, uh, and Michael uses the term standardizable candle. OK. But you know, once you've read the label on the light bulb, OK, then you know, you can look at nearby light bulbs and figure out their true power and then look at more distant ones will look fainter and thus determine their distance and even more distant ones look fainter still. Of course, with headlights, your eyes are, and brain are also looking at the angular separation. That's a consistency check, which you don't get when you look at a, a single headlight motorcyclist, okay? Um, but the point is they're not all 100 watts, some are 60, some are 175, but there's a way of reading the label on the light bulb, okay? So that's the great thing. That's how they're standardizable. And so then Edwin Hubble realized that this thing, well, we now know is 2.4 million light years away. I think he got somewhat the wrong answer because it wasn't yet known that there are two types of Cepheid variables, blah, blah, blah. The R.R. Lyrae stars, by the way, that are in globular clusters are related to these things. They're the lower, lower luminosity, shorter period cousins of the Cepheids. But nevertheless, even Hubble's distance placed the Andromeda Nebula well outside the any reasonable limits for the size of the Milky Way galaxy, which was the universe back then. And so he settled this, this, uh, this debate, the famous Shapley Curtis debate of, um, of 1925, because he found these things in the other spiral nebulae as well. Okay, so these things are, are galaxies of hundreds of billions of stars. He figuratively expanded our view of the universe with that discovery. But for the purposes of this presentation, his next one was more important. Um, he saw that the nearby ones are moving away pretty quickly, and the more distant ones like these ones in the Virgo cluster um, are moving away more quickly. Uh, and he had their distances because of the Cepheid variables. Okay, that's what Slipher did not have. But the rascal that Hubble was, here's his plot 
from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, published in 1929, where, by the way, he means kilometers per second for the speed, but he only indicates kilometers, you know, oh, well. And a parsec is, you know, three and a quarter light years. All right. So, yeah, there's this, um, you know, loose correlation. You took a bit of a leap of faith to believe in it. But my objection is that though Hubble determined the distances through the use of Cepheid variables, he took the speeds from Slifer's paper and didn't even cite it. Now, you know, today a professor who commits such an egregious and intentional breach of research ethics could well be fired, uh, even if they have tenure. Um, but somehow Hubble got away with this. Um, and a number of other things, actually, where he essentially stole things from other people. I'm not saying he wasn't a great astronomer. He was, but he also got way too much credit at the expense of others, in my humble opinion. Okay, It's not necessarily the only valid opinion, but it's my opinion. But anyway, here's his original plot. Uh, and then later with Milton Hemison, they you know measured many, many more distances. And in 1931, published a paper that really showed this relationship very, very well, okay? And with type 1a exploding stars, which I'll have more to say in a few minutes, you know, you can see, in fact, here in the lower left corner of this plot is the region encompassed in Hubble's original uh, plot, okay? Which has a lot of scatter for a, a lot of reasons, you know? Um, but now when you go farther out, there's much less scatter. And, you know, one of the reasons is that the very nearby galaxies are tugged around by the gravity of nearby clusters or whatever. They have what are called peculiar velocities, which uh, adds to or subtracts from the speed they have because of the so-called Hubble flow, the expansion of the universe. But when you go out to much greater distances, most of the speed is caused by the, the expansion of the universe. And so relatively speaking, the amount of scatter goes down as a fractional thing. And you get to see this linear relationship, at least when you go out to just, you know, a billion light years or so, it's a linear relationship. It isn't linear later on, and that'll what lead to the accelerating universe. But, but anyway, it really is an expanding universe. And, you know, we would call this the, the Hubble law for the longest time. Speed of a galaxy now is proportional to its distance now. I don't like the term Hubble constant, I prefer Hubble parameter because, in fact, the Hubble constant changes with time for pretty much any universe other than an exponentially expanding universe. So it's just constant in the sense that we believe that over a big enough volume of space, at a given time, all regions of the universe have the same value. But it's certainly not a constant in time. Um, the other thing is that it, it's now called the Hubble Lemetrela. Uh, although the constant or the parameter is still known as Hubble's constant. And that's because Lemaitre in um, 1927 actually came up with this and published it in an obscure Belgian journal. This was two years before Hubble's thing. And, um, you know, so Lemaitre is finally getting the credit that, that he deserved. And turns out there were other people as well. Lundmark, I believe, in Sweden. And a few others, I mean, Michael uh, likes the history of astronomy. He may know this better than I do, but there were actually a number of people who, who were thinking along these lines. Um, uh, but for decades and decades, Hubble got all the, all the credit, okay. Anyway, Hubble Lemaitre law. All right, so though Hubble himself resisted this interpretation, the modern view uh, espoused by most, but not all astrophysicists is that the redshift is actually caused by an expansion of space. It's what's called a cosmological redshift. It's not that the galaxies are like bullets moving through some pre-existing space. And that would mean then that the redshift is a Doppler shift. Now, there are some cosmologists who treat it as a Doppler shift, and they have a whole bunch of infinitesimal Doppler shifts added up to each other. That's a little bit like treating Einstein's general theory of relativity which deals with gravity and accelerations as a whole bunch of little incremental constant velocity slices, which are dealt with in special relativity. And you, know, you can add them all together and get general relativity, but the far more fundamental view is that you know, 
gravity is caused by space-time curvature, yada, yada, yada. Um, but just, you know, it, full disclosure, not all astrophysicists view the redshift as being caused by an expansion of space, but most of us, and certainly those who subscribe to the general theory of relativity, treat it as such. So basically, the coordinate grid is what's expanding, and the galaxies are not expanding because, you know, they're held together by gravity. Um, there's the visible matter, there's the dark matter. I'll have a bit more to say about that in a few minutes. Uh, planetary systems are not expanding. Planets are not expanding either. They're held by gravity. You're held to Earth's surface by gravity. You're not, you know, Earth isn't expanding. And then you're held together by electromagnetic forces, uh, not by gravity. Um, you're held together by, by residual electromagnetic forces, even though you're electrically neutral. And so you're not expanding either. If, if, you, if you do expand after a large lunch or dinner, that's your fault, not the universe's fault, okay? So anyway, with modern telescopes, we've measured the current expansion rate and we know it pretty well, although not perfectly well. And that's where the surprise will come at the end of my talk, okay? So, but initially I wanna say that, well, you know, you expect the rate to be changing with time. And that's because, you know, you've got all these galaxies. Here's part of the Hubble ultra deep field. You're all familiar with this. There's only a couple of stars in our own galaxy in this whole picture, it's amazing. You go deep enough outside the galactic plane and you're dominated by galaxies. So, you know, these over here are pulling on those over there. And if the density of the universe is high enough, the expansion uh, will slow down and come to a stop someday and then reverse its motion. And instead of a big bang, you'll have a gnab gib, which is big bang backwards, okay? Or you'll have a, a big crunch where the universe comes together. So. If you live in a dense universe and you're lying on your back watching galaxies getting fainter and smaller, you think, yes, you live in a well-behaved universe. But then you'd not notice something a bit peculiar. And right around now, you'd get kind of nervous. And then, ah, goodbye, cruel world, right? The universe would collapse in on you. That's one possible fate of the universe. But it's also possible that the universe's density is sufficiently low that although all the galaxies are pulling on each other, slowing down the expansion of space, it will never come to a stop and it'll certainly then never reverse itself, okay? That would be like a universe, like a, an apple launched at a speed greater than or equal to Earth's escape speed, neglect, neglecting the ceiling above me uh, and air resistance and all that. So that, that's a possible fate of the universe where the galaxies just keep on getting fainter and dimmer forever. And so instead of, you know, ending in a dense, um, fiery, uh, big crunch, you'd have a universe that ends up being cold and dark and dilute, you know. And cosmologists would like to know what kind of universe we live in just, just because, you know. It's not going to make a better toaster, but it might excite some kids uh, to go into STEM fields and they may, might become useful to society as computer scientists or engineers or medical physicists or, or applied physicists. But, you know, the bug that bites them is often astronomy. So that would be a good thing. And then, you know, maybe there will be some spinoff in 100 years or something, you know, uh, who knows, right? Um, quantum mechanics and general relativity are good examples where that happened. But Fundamentally, cosmologists just want to know. So how do we do this? Well, you know, you can examine the past history of the expansion to predict the future. So here I have this apple and I toss it. Can't give a talk about gravity without using the pro proverbial Newtonian apple, right? If I were to measure its speed at many different times and see that it's slowing down a lot, then I could predict that it'll someday stop and reverse its motion. If instead I measure its speed and uh, it's not slowing down a lot, then it'll expand forever. And so in a similar way, if, uh, if oh, Jen says, I'm still going to blame the universe, uh, universal expansion on my own, right? Nature loves balance. balance. Uh, thank you, Jen. Anyway, um, so if we were to measure the past history of the expansion, we could determine, at least in principle, the fate of the universe. Um, so we can measure today's expansion rate. I'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but how do we measure what it used to be? Well, as most of you know, um, you look 
to great distances. And then you're looking into the past. Uh, light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. You see the sun a little over eight minutes ago as it was, because that's how long it takes to traverse 150 million kilometers. The typical bright stars in the sky you see as they were tens or hundreds of years ago. Uh, Delta, Cephei, I think, no, no. Um, oh, the, oh, come on, uh, Deneb, Deneb, I think, uh, it's one of the brightest stars in the sky that's like more than a thousand light years. It's something like 1500 or something, but one of the stars of the summer triangle is actually one of the most distant stars your eye can see easily at second magnitude or whatever. But most of them are tens or hundreds of light years, you know. Um, and so then if you look at galaxies that are a billion light years away or four billion light years away, and maybe that little blob there is nine billion light years away, what we're really talking about are look back times. I mean, the, the galaxy started out closer than, than nine billion, and now it's more than nine billion, but nine billion years is what it took to, for the light to reach us. It's just that when we talk to reporters for convenience, we just say it's nine billion light years years away because it's too complicated for most reporters to understand that it used to be closer, it's now farther away, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, encoded in the light in the form of the redshift is information about how much the universe has expanded during the time that the light was in transit toward us. And it's that functional form, redshift versus look back, uh, sorry, Redshift versus, yeah, redshift versus look back time. That functional form is what tells us the expansion history of the universe. It would be a different functional form if the universe has been slowing down a lot versus very little. So we want redshift you know, versus distance determined in a way other than with the Hubble law. Because we're no longer assuming a linear Hubble law. We're, we're going far enough back in time that we want to see changes in the Hubble law. That's the whole point. So you need distances determined independently of the redshift, right? This is a bit of a subtlety that is often not understood, even by a number of professional astronomers I know who are not cosmologists. They just say, well, use the redshift. We can't use the redshift because then it's a circular argument. We need the distance or look back time in a way that's independent of the redshift, okay? So how do we do it? Well, we do it for nearby galaxies with Henrietta Leavitt's Cepheid variables. And Michael uh, confirmed that this is Delta CPI indeed at a period of 5.37 days. But for the distant galaxies here, you know, you, you can't see individual stars. Even the most luminous Cepheids are like, 1,000 to uh, 10,000 solar luminosities, 10,000 at the 100 day period. But you know, if you want to look at billions of light years, you're not going to see Cepheid variables, okay? There's a billion stars all smushed into one little blob right there, okay? So we need something intrinsically much more luminous than Cepheid variables, all right? And so what we use are supernovae, which is what Michael found, excuse me, in starburst galaxies, you might wonder, you know, if a galaxy is forming lots of stars, why would some of the stars be blowing up? It's because some of the stars are very massive stars. Those are a small minority, but the ones that are 10 solar masses and above, roughly speaking, blow up through core collapse of their iron core, and then the layers surrounding that bounce off, they get a kick from the mechanical bounce, but there's also a whole bunch of neutrinos get emitted and all you need is 1% of those neutrinos to interact with the material, and that drives the explosion. And we saw that very, very well with supernova 1987A, where the neutrinos were indeed detected by the Irvine, Michigan, Brookhaven experiment and um, the Kamiokanda thing in Japan. So this is, you know, a very famous supernova really launched this field. It was a field in which not many people worked before supernova 1987A. But, um, you know, so this is a supernova and this is a type two. It has a hydrogen envelope. It came from the explosion of a massive star. But the type one A's um, can become a billion or even a couple of billion times the sun's power. And so here's a galaxy with 100 billion stars. And at its peak there, let me try to stop it right there. 
it's about as bright as the central billion or couple of billion stars in you know normal suns in this galaxy so so they're like really luminous all right and uh you know and if they're all the same then it's great then they're a standard candle but they're not all the same but there's a way of reading the light label okay and so that then becomes a much better distance indicator for very large distances than cepheid variables because this is 10 to the nine a billion solar luminosities and a cepheid is only 10 to the four uh 10 000 solar luminosities okay so you know our our sun will not blow up this way uh but but if it did sunblock of 50 just wouldn't cut it folks you'd need sunblock or supernova block of a few billion to protect yourself right but don't worry be happy we're pretty confident that the sun isn't going to end its life this way if it does you know the university can fire me and and, and michael richmond and the least of our worries if the sun blows up is being fired from our respective jobs at our universities okay so uh, but don't worry be happy our our sun will turn into a red giant and then a solitary white dwarf but not you know a, a binary so here's one that i think michael was involved with before we had our telescope up at lick observatory we had one at leuschner observatory and uh, michael you were my student at the time of supernova 1994d were you not i believe um, that was one of seven that we discovered at leuschner before moving up to lick i think 94d was one of our really great ones because it was in this gorgeous galaxy i don't know if, is this the black eye galaxy or one of them that has one of these 526 i think and you see 4826 you're right and that's not the black eye galaxy right um anyway you can look it up because you can type it up but this is one that I think you got your PhD in 95, right, Michael? Uh, yeah, something it like that. It depends on whether when I actually got the PhD or when I left Berkeley, because they were yeah. separated by a little bit of time. That's Close enough. True. Close enough. But you remember 94D, right? Wow. 20, 27 years ago. Not quite Supernova 87A, but uh, still getting back there in time. We're we're both getting older, Michael. So <laughs> anyway, um, so that's a type 1A. And how do, you know, how do you distinguish them? Well, again, you, you, you get a spectrum and you do this for a bunch of them and you plot the intensity versus you know, wavelength. And so you know, blue is around 450 nanometers, 4,500 angstroms. And red is you know, 6,500. Let's see, there's a chat thing. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Michael's thesis, maybe. Um, so the type twos are the ones that have hydrogen, the, the most common element in the universe, but the type ones are the ones that don't. And now there's a bunch of variations. And I like the one Bs and Cs from my upcoming Hubble program, because they're basically massive stars that explode in the type two way, but they got rid of their hydrogen either through winds of their own or by transferring material to a binary companion star. Uh, and there's something else in the chat, yeah. Um, so, so uh, you know, so you look at these the spectrum, and you know, there's no hydrogen, there's no helium. So what the hell is this thing? Uh, and there are other clues as well. So what we think it is is a white dwarf in a binary system, either with a more or less normal star that has turned into started turning into a red giant, like you know, let's say Arcturus or something like that. But it starts filling its Roche lobe, which is its lobe of gravitational dominance, and that then transfers material onto the white dwarf. And that's exactly the same picture as for a nova. And usually for the recurrent novae, you get this blast, which is a thermonuclear explosion at the surface of the white dwarf. And if anything, that ejects more material than what actually had been accreted. So the novae. The recurrent novae are not on their way to becoming a type 1a supernova. This is again something that even my many of my professional astronomy buddies don't know because it blows off, if anything, at least as much material as it accreted. But in some cases, the system can somehow bypass the recurrent nova stage and keep on accreting. And Ken Namoto and others have done this. It's for certain accretion rates. So and for certain separations and stuff. So then the white dwarf can gradually um, approach the Chandrasekhar limit, where it can then undergo a 
thermonuclear runaway. And unlike the sun, which is a nice thermostat, once nuclear reactions start in a white dwarf, it doesn't expand and cool the way our sun would if you were to take a blowtorch to the middle of our sun. It's made out of degenerate material, which is not that it's morally reprehensible or anything like that. That's just the, the name that quantum physicists give to material that's highly packed together and stuff. And its uh, pressure is independent of temperature. And so what happens is you have some nuclear reactions and instead of expanding the material, it goes into speeding up the nuclei nearby and they crash into each other, fuse, emit more energy and so forth. So this thing goes off as a thermonuclear runaway. And it does it in about the same way at about the same mass each way, each time. Or you can have two white dwarfs that merge together. And usually one of them is less massive than the other. The less massive one because of quantum physics is bigger than the more massive one, unlike bricks. And it gets tidally torn apart and some of the material then settles on the surface. And once again, the thing gets blown up near the Chandra limit. So you might think these things are, you know, all of, of a standard luminosity, but they're details, you know, depending on the age of the white dwarf and the chemical composition, it's mostly carbon and oxygen, but there are various pollutants and stuff. They're not all 100 watt light bulbs or 1 billion solar luminosity light bulbs. They have some variation, but we have a way of reading the label on the light bulb. The ones that are more luminous rise and decline in brightness more slowly than the ones that are less luminous, okay? And the least luminous ones rise and decline even more quickly. So by measuring the light curves, we have a way of reading the label on the light bulb, and these become calibratable candles. Let me just, uh, the, the um, chat room there, okay, yeah. So um, in either case, we, we can then calibrate these things uh, if we have observed enough of them. And, you know, the trick is observing enough of them, but they only go off. In fact, the type 1As go off in a typical galaxy maybe once every 100 years for an elliptical galaxy once every 500 years. Um, and, and moreover, you know, you need a bunch of these things before you can tell that they're standard or before you can correlate their luminosity with their light curve and stuff. So, you know, Michael is very familiar with this. He helped develop the Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope. I think he wrote some of the software for it. What a pleasure, Michael, to, this was completely unanticipated, by the way. Um, so uh, Michael and Dick Treffers and Wei Dong Lee, uh, who was a very close collaborator of mine for, for 14 years before he tragically passed away. But we developed first the Leuschner system and then this thing, the Berkeley Automatic Imaging Telescope, which then got named the Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope because I got some funding from the Jim and Sylvia Katzman Foundation. But it, you know, takes a picture of a thousand different galaxies a night, and you know, a week later takes another picture. Now our cadence is more like every night, and usually nothing new appears. But then here's this uh, here's this new thing, and it could be an asteroid or a cosmic ray or something like that. But out of a dozen images that show something interesting, out of you know the one thousand images that were taken, we have undergraduates, uh, as in this photograph here who analyze the images and determine which things are likely to be asteroids or cosmic rays or, or novae or genuine supernovae. And, and we're of course interested in the supernovae and I need to take a new team photo once a number of us can get together again. Some of my team is still away in Asia or whatever, but here's a picture taken in 2019, pre-COVID-19 and I'm very proud of the, of the students. Okay. So the students also get to participate in monitoring these things with the Nickel telescope at Lick Observatory, which is the telescope that Michael actually used for gathering the data for his thesis. We didn't yet have the robotic telescope working reliably at the time that he was getting his data. And then we can also use the three meter telescope to get a spectra of these things. And so that makes Lick Observatory a very powerful combination of instruments with Kate looking for them, the one meter telescope getting um, the light curves and then the three meter getting the spectra. And students now contribute more than ever before. In fact, Michael, you'd be amazed. Uh, I'm sure at RIT they do this sort of thing too, but there's been a big increase in student involvement throughout the University of California system because we made these observing rooms with, you know, fast internet, we're connected to the observatories 
and so students can operate the telescopes and uh, from our from our Campbell Hall, which is where our own astronomy department at Berkeley is. And a student who has early morning classes the next day can observe until midnight, and then some other student can take the graveyard shift. And during COVID, where we were all locked up at home, we've even developed ways in which we now run these telescopes from our home laptops. And you just have to manage the real estate and have lots of little windows to which you can click on, right? Because obviously, you know, most of us don't have four or five screens like that at home. But still, um, students are now evolved like never before. So we have, you know, here's Kate, here's the, here's the automatic planet finder, which I don't have time to talk about. It's, um, it's used to search for exoplanets by taking spectra and looking for Doppler shifts each night. So that's a really great thing. And then here's the three meter. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing. These aren't bigger, big telescopes by today's standards, but they're equipped with modern equipment. So they're really good. But funding for the University of California is really quite uncertain these days, especially because of the whole financial impact of the pandemic on universities. And so we've been told that we are having a 15% cut in the LIC budget for the indeterminate number of years uh, into the future. So, so some years ago, um, working with Google, I got a gift for 1.5 million and we're now raising matching private donations. I'm in fact writing a proposal now to Google showing how with their gift, we were able to get additional donations and stuff. And that makes them happy, of course. And these donations can also be used for student and postdoctoral fellowships, not just for running the equipment at the observatory. So if this is something uh, to which you'd like to contribute, no, no amount is too small. Go to give.berkeley.edu, put lick in the search box. We will be forever grateful. Of course, there's so many great charities to which to uh, donate these days. But if, you know, if this is the thing, the kind of thing that matches your heartstrings, then uh, please go ahead and do so. And if you'd like, if you know someone who might like Lick Observatory to be renamed the XYZ Institute of Astrophysics, of which the main building still is then called Lick Observatory for legal reasons reasons and stuff, you know, contact me or even or even for somewhat smaller, but still major donations. But again, no donation is too small. So anyway, we find these ones in nearby galaxies. So then the trick is to find them in distant galaxies. And um, the supernova is used to measure the distance of a galaxy by using the inverse square law and looking at how bright it appears to be and knowing how powerful it really is. And then the redshift from the spectrum as well. Okay. So those are the key things I said we need. We need this functional form look back time or distance versus redshift. Okay. So this is fantastic. You just want to find these things in these distant fuzzy blobs. Um, uh, yeah. Michael says bring back um, uh, memories. I, I'm glad. I'm glad it does so. Um, so anyway. Uh, yeah, so how do we do that? Well, okay, we use big telescopes primarily in the Southern hemisphere with wide angle fields of view. Uh, here's one that's about the area of the full moon, although of course uh, the, the full moon is not rectangular in size, but here you get the mug shots of a couple of thousand galaxies. Uh, and then you take 50 such pictures in a night. And then three weeks later, you uh, take pictures of the same 50 fields and you look for changes again, through digital subtraction. Um, in fact, amateur astronomers have uh, contributed to the search for nearby supernovae magnificently. Uh, I forgot to mention that by, you know, Tim Puckett and, and many others. And of course, the Reverend Robert Evans did it by eye, okay? But now we do digital subtraction for the distant ones, just like we do that for the nearby ones. But Reverend Evans has found 40 some odd of these things just by looking at galaxies. So for the fainter ones, that's not so great because uh, you know it's harder to memorize the fields uh, over a complex image like this. But through digital subtraction, you find them. There they are. And um, my job on both of the teams that that did this work in the starting in the early 1990s was to use the world's greatest optical telescopes, the twin Keck 10 meter telescopes on Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii, to get spectra of these things. And so here's an example. 1995 FF with a redshift of 0.455. So all the wavelengths have been stretched to the red by four 
by 455 percent okay so um sorry by 45.5 percent i i got my decimal point confused a little bit um so you know you know i mean nearly 50 percent so 4,000 angstroms becomes close to 6,000 angstroms. And you can see that this spectrum looks a lot like the spectrum of a low redshift type 1a supernova. And there are some differences, but they're within the noise, okay? But this big feature here caused by calcium is there in both. Here's a feature from um, singly ionized silicon, which is clearly in both. And then there are some features of iron and stuff. So that's really great. And then here's one of these IAU circulars that came out in October of 1996. We, um, as part of the high redshift supernova search team, high Z team, led by Brian Schmidt and Nick Sunseff, we reported 17 type 1a supernovae from redshifts of 0.09 to 0.84, okay? And you can see here the telescope that was used and all the Ks, I'm proud to say, are Keck, okay? So that's really great. Um, the MM, the M, I think, is the multiple mirror telescope in Arizona. That's for some of the lower redshift ones and stuff. But, but anyway, Keck contributed quite a lot here. I guess my students at that time were Doug Leonard and Aaron Barth. I guess uh, Michael had just left uh, in 95 or 96 to become, I think, uh, a postdoc with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey at Princeton, if I'm not mistaken, Michael. But anyway, this was really cool. And um, so then here's the punchline. These guys look really faint, and basically they look fainter at a given redshift than they should have been in any well-behaved decelerating universe, or even in a universe that's not slowing down at all, right? Suppose the density is so low that it's nearly zero. I mean, it's not quite zero because we're all alive and we, we're here, but the density might be close to zero, in which case they wouldn't be slowing down much at all. But these guys are more distant given their redshift than expected even in a constant expansion universe. So that's really bizarre, right? So that suggests that the universe actually accelerated because of some you know, cosmic anti-gravity force at work. And I was actually privileged to be the first on both teams um, uh, to announce this result. Although by 1998, actually even by 1996, I was working with the Schmidt team. I had moved over from Saul Perlmutter's Supernova Cosmology Project just because of a cultural difference in how they did things. They were sort of experimental high energy particle physicists who culturally were different than um, astronomers that I had grown up with um, and stuff. So, so um, this was really an amazing moment in my life where I got to announce this. And, you know, we, we use the term anti-gravity hesitantly because people ask us, you know, can we attach the stuff, whatever it is, to our cars and levitate over Los Angeles traffic jams? And the, the answer is no, you can't. This is either a property of space or such a small amount of a weird type of energy flying through space that it would take millions of light years to collect up enough of this stuff. Nevertheless, you know, um, by the end of December, no one had found anything clearly wrong with what we had done, and the editors of Science Magazine claimed that this was the most interesting and important er uh, discovery of science that year, and Einstein, the caricature of Einstein, looks surprised, not because he's blowing multiple universes out of his pipe. You might not have known about multiple universes and how they come from the pipes of theoretical physicists. Well, there may well be multiple universes, but they probably don't come from the pipes of theoretical physicists. But rather, he's surprised because he has this sheaf of papers where there's a, this equation, a lambda equals 8 pi g times the density of the vacuum. What the hell, right? Well, I'm the, just the messenger here, not just some bozo from Berserkly. Back in his day, 1917, when he developed general relativity, People knew that the sky wasn't falling. And even though the nature of the spiral nebulae was not yet completely known, the spirit of the argument still holds that things should be pulling on each other and the universe, if anything, should be collapsing in on itself. And manifestly, it is not. So he came up with this thing called lambda cosmological constant to negate the attractive effects of gravity. And it was of unknown physical origin. And there were no experiments in laboratories that suggested that it was present. And it had to be finely tuned to be exactly equal to the attractive effect of gravity. So he never really liked this. 
um, but he felt compelled to introduce the idea. When Hubble and Lemaitre discovered and Lamarck discovered the expansion of the universe, Einstein renounced this idea as having been supposedly the biggest blunder of his career. So here he is sad that he ever introduced this because he could have been the theoretical physicist who predicted that the universe is likely to be in some dynamic state. Um, he could have been famous. I like to joke, okay, right? You know, <laughs> instead, you know, he renounced the cosmological constant in 1929, saying there's no more physical reason to believe in it. Um, and, and yet, you know, here we are resuscitating the idea the better part of a century later. So if he were around, his, his reaction might have been, you know, in seeing that we're, you know, this thing is re rearing its ugly head again, his, his reaction might have been something like on the cover of, of Science Magazine. This is a very famous photograph of Einstein. So, um, you know, so this is one idea that it's lambda, but maybe it's not the cosmological constant, which would be, you know, the cosmological constant is a innate energy of space, of the vacuum. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's some weird energy flying through space. And so we generically call that dark energy. Okay, I mean, you know, the cosmological constant is one form of dark energy, but a very special form. It's the energy of the vacuum. But there are many other things that could be weird forms of energy floating around within space. And we don't see it, so it's dark and it's of mysterious origin. So in that sense, it's dark too. But when you combine the supernova measurements with other things, and I won't get into the weeds here because I will, I'll want to, you know, Q&A and stuff, but uh, this is 70% of the universe. Sure, it doesn't dominate in the room or where you are, but, you know, averaged over the millions of light years of what we used to think was empty space, there's a little bit of dark en energy in every cubic centimeter, and so it ends up dominating, and it's 70% of the universe, and we don't know what it is. Then there's the dark matter, which is 25% uh, of the universe, and we don't know what that is, so we don't know what 95% of the universe is. This is not your mother's universe, okay? Uh, the universe that I grew up with as a student was not even the 5%. It was more like 0.5% because that's the easily part, visible part of the ordinary matter in the form of stars. It turns out even most of the ordinary matter doesn't glow very much at optical wavelengths. And you, know, you can see it in the ultraviolet and x-rays and stuff. But when I was a student, we didn't have many such observations. So this is a very different universe than, than we used to think. Dark matter, um, you've probably had talks on this, but just to refresh your memory, spiral galaxies are rotating. And you know, Vera Rubin showed in the 1970s that they would fly apart if there weren't some additional stuff holding them together. We call that dark matter. Then there's clusters of galaxies whose individual galaxies are moving so quickly that the clusters would fly apart unless there were additional stuff holding them together. And that actually goes back, that predates Vera Rubin by four and a half decades in 1931 or 33, let's say. Fritz Zwicky, one of my heroes, and I was a graduate student at Caltech, but I arrived too late after he had passed away. But he noticed this for the coma cluster of galaxies, I think it was, and made the argument not very forcefully. It was one of four or five things that he said, just almost as an aside in a, a single paragraph, four or five ideas that might explain this, but one of them was, you know, Dunkelmatter, dark, dark matter. Uh, but he, you know, he was ignored, as was Vera Rubin decades later, uh, in part because some of his ideas kind of were crazy, but in part because he was so ahead of his time that his colleagues uh, just couldn't fathom what he was talking about. And, and he was also arrogant and abrasive and didn't think much of the intellectual capabilities of his Caltech colleagues. Here, perhaps, He's showing you what he thinks of their typical brain size. And, you know, Caltech is a pretty brainy place with a lot of, you know, big egos. And they did not respond well to this colleague of his implying that they were kind of dim. Uh, I don't know that that's what he's thinking here, but he might be thinking that. He is on record as having referred to his colleagues as spherical bastards. And that's because they're bastards any way you look at them. Now, you know, a sphere is the only object that looks the same from all directions, right? So <laughs> spherical bastards, right? Now, I don't advocate you calling your friends that because you will quickly end up being friendless. But um, anyway, that's what he did. What is dark matter? Who knows? Some of it is black holes, 
which are have such such great curvature of space time that nothing, not even light, can escape. You know, uh, as you may have heard, astrophysicists have a saying: "What happens in black holes stays in black holes." Right? But probably most of it isn't black holes because they would have lensed gravitationally background stars more often than 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 is observed. So WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, have been the favorite for a couple of decades. I would say now their stock is going down because no one has found them in laboratories. The other candidate is a particle called an axion, and its stock is going up, not because anyone has found them, but just because if WIMPs go up, axions go down, sort of, you know, total amount of stock remains the same. But it's a big mystery. You know, what, what is the dark matter? I'm beginning to worry that, you know, this may be an incorrect idea completely, but that's the best we have right now. Dark energy, we have even less of an idea of, of what it is, uh, but I'll just in a few minutes show you what it is we're trying to do to try to figure it out now. Anyway, its physical origin is a huge mystery. Many physicists claim it to be the most important observationally motivated unsolved problem in physics today. 70% of the universe, and it may provide a clue to the desired unification of quantum physics and gravitation. You know, it's believed to be a quantum phenomenon that is occurring everywhere. And so as such, any string theory or, you know, quantum loop gravity or any other such thing that does not allow for the possibility of an accelerating universe can be removed as a candidate viable theory of everything, okay? And some such theories have been removed. Trouble is there are too many remaining that are consistent with the accelerating expansion of the universe. But anyway, it's an important thing. The discovery was honored with the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011. It went to Saul Perlmutter and Brian Schmidt, the respective leaders of the two teams. And I'm very happy that it also went to Adam Reese, who was my postdoctoral scholar starting in 96 or so. Shortly after Michael left, actually, Adam came and you know, we just worked together on a number of projects, including his measurements of the apparent brightnesses of these distant type 1As. And so he got recognized as well. On Saul's team, probably the first person to recognize it was Gerson Goldhaber, but he passed away in 2010. I speculate that this is one reason that the Nobel Committee waited until 2011, because they can't give it to four people. And in my opinion, Gerson deserved it as well. Uh, but that's just my speculation. And the other thing is that by 2011, there were many other ways in which you could tell that this acceleration probably was occurring. But these gentlemen invited the rest of us who had worked hard to participate in Nobel Week, and that was a lot of fun. And here at the High Z Team Celebratory Lunch, my wife, Noelle, revealed the consolation prize to all of us who did not technically win the Nobel Prize. It was this T-shirt, Dark Energy is the New Black which I am wearing right now. She sent it along with a $2 bill to the King of Sweden with an anonymous note saying, your Royal Highness or however she referred to the King of Sweden, here are two things you're unlikely to already have, this t-shirt and a US $2 bill. So um, anyway, we, we don't know how he responded to this because uh, it was an anonymously sent gift. <laughs> So uh, anyway, uh, some years ago, we were all recognized with the Breakthrough Prize, and that was nice. You know, they're more in the 21st century. They realize big science is done by big teams. But really, the, the real gift was doing the research and never in my wildest dreams as a kid that I think that I would be involved in research that ended up being so um, important to, if not humanity, then at least to physicists. You know, I just thought, hey, I'll be lucky if I contribute in some small way to humankind's understanding of nature. So bringing us to the last part, okay. Uh, and, and by the way, I'll, I can hang on until beyond 930 by a little bit. It's not quite as hard to cut off. I don't have a plane to catch, but is dark energy really Lambda? Okay. Well, we, you know, the data have been up to now consistent with this null hypothesis, the simplest hypothesis is that it's just a vacuum energy, but, but we're not sure, okay? And so even like 15 years ago, Adam and Adam Reese and I started a project. Adam was the PI, still is the PI, 
for addressing this question. Uh, and a number of people are trying to do it. I think, Michael, you may be involved with the dark energy survey and stuff like that being done with that telescope that I showed in the Southern Hemisphere, the Blanco telescope. But the basic idea is that small differences in the past history of the universe can lead to quite different predictions of what the dark energy will do in the future. And it, it may even become gravitationally attractive for all we know, since we don't know what it is. And if there's enough of it, there could even still be the big crunch, or it could be constant per unit volume. That is its density is not changing. That would be a property of space itself. Then you get a forever accelerating universe, which one of these days will become an exponential, right? Doubling every unit of time, kind of like the thing we didn't want SARS-CoV-2 to do, right? But that would not rip us apart because, you know, clusters of galaxies and galaxies are gravitationally bound together um, in a way that's too strong for dark energy to rip them apart. But if the dark energy became stronger per unit volume, then you could even get the big rip where clusters of galaxies get ripped apart and then galaxies and then planetary systems and then stars and planets and us and even the atoms of which you are made, okay? So that would be the big rip. Um, it's a theoretically not very attractive possibility because it doesn't con conserve energy um, in the simplest form of the conservation law, but the conservation law is not something that is, you know, God given. We don't know that conservation of energy is in fact correct. Um, this, if you want to look into it more, violates what's called the weak energy condition. But anyway, it's of interest to know what the universe will do. And so to do that, you have to measure this curve really well in the past. And the tactic we took was to measure the current expansion rate really, really well and compare it with what the prediction would be based on observations of the early universe coupled with the standard model of cosmology, okay? So here's what we did and here's the surprise. The current rate of expansion is higher than expected even taking into account the known acceleration. Now, what do I mean by higher than expected compared with what? Okay, and I'm running out of time and I don't want to get into the weeds and plus I don't even know the weeds all that well because this is a complicated subject and these are not measurements that I make. But radio astronomers have been using a series of ground-based and space-based telescopes with ever greater precision culminating most recently with the Planck satellite that you know measures the cosmic microwave background radiation, which comes to us from when the universe was opaque, okay, transitioning from being opaque to transparent. And that was 380,000 years ago. And you see that it has these little freckles in temperature and hence density. And they're not big. The universe is largely isotropic. It looks the same everywhere but at a part per 10,000 down to a part per 100,000, there are variations in temperature that correspond to variations in density. That's good for us. Otherwise, clusters of galaxies and galaxies wouldn't have formed if the universe had been perfectly smooth. But you take these things whose physical size can be predicted very, very well, independent of what our universe is doing today, because at early times, all the models are the same. It basically, you know, what was what's called the sound horizon? How far could sound waves have traveled by the time the universe was 380,000 years old? And that's a, a rather model independent calculation, okay? So then you take this, you know the size of the freckles, and you take the standard model of cosmology, okay, in which the dark energy is lambda, because up until you know now, the data have been consistent with that simplest hypothesis. And you take the data and propagate them forward to predict what the Hubble parameters should be now. Okay, so that's the prediction. And that prediction is 67.4 plus or minus 0.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec, the unit that is used in the Hubble law because when you multiply by a unit of distance in V equals H naught D, 
the megaparsecs go away and you just get a speed kilometers per second all right okay 67.4 with a remarkably small error bar okay for years and years the measured value of the hubble constant had a big error bar and the error bars allowed the measurements then to overlap the previous direct ones were sort of like 70 to 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec plus or minus four to seven well you know 70 minus three is you know 67 so that that's great and you know 75 minus seven is 68 and you know that's consistent with that so you know it wasn't clear there was a possible conflict but the values overlapped and the error bars were large and uncertain okay that was the that was the problem and yeah going back to Iona's uh, question that's 380,000 years after the big bang that's right that's where this picture is coming from it's astonishing actually that they can do that but they're measuring the cosmic microwave background radiation so this is a a picture of the infant universe when it was only 380,000 years old okay so we measured the current expansion rate with type 1a supernovae. This is what I do, okay? I do type 1a, but in the coming month, type 1b and 1c, and David's gonna help me find that because I'm really you know, getting anxious. Not only do we wanna do the science, but money gets released with Hubble Space Telescope observations. And there's a graduate student that I need to pay, okay? So I really need this observation. So we used Hubble and Keck, uh, to make measurements of the luminosity, the peak luminosity of type 1As. And how did we do it? Well, we found some well-observed type 1As, and here's a ground-based picture, and here's a Hubble picture. And here are circles circling what? Cepheid variables, okay? So we're going back to the tried and true technique that everyone and their grandmother, especially if your grandmother was Henrietta Leavitt, used to determine the distances of nearby galaxies. All right, no one argues with this technique. So here are the Cepheids, and yeah, there's a metallicity correction. You know, their their period luminosity relationship also depends a little bit on the how, how many heavy elements exist, and that's where I made measurements with the Keck telescopes. The, the so-called heavy element abundance. It's a small but important correction. Most of the measurements were made with Hubble. Okay, so here's what we get. 73.2 plus or minus 1.3 kilometers per second per megaparsec as compared with 67.4 plus or minus 0.5. Even if you're not well-versed in statistics, I think you can see these error bars don't allow the values to overlap, at least not very easily. There's a conflict at 4.2 standard deviations, okay? So the uncertainties we have are smaller than before, and we think we really understand this uncertainty. There's not a big uncertainty in the uncertainty itself. We've taken great pains to understand the uncertainty. And by the way, if you adopt our value, this is not in any of the textbooks, not even in my textbook, the age of the universe is only 12.8 billion years, giga years, not 13.8. And that's because the universe has been expanding faster than everyone thought. And so to reach a particular separation, two clusters of galaxies didn't need as much time, okay? So the universe is a, bit, a billion years younger than we thought. And you might say, well, you know, 4.2 sigma, and this is only one technique. True, but here's the deal. There are now other techniques that I don't have much time to go into, but SHOES was our measurement. It's a tortured acronym, but whatever. It's a F right here. But there are other ways of doing it. Uh, and all the today's universe measurements basically cluster around 73 okay plus or minus one and all the measurements that deal with the microwave background or its derivatives the bao stands for baryonic acoustic oscillations and stuff like that that they're all going back to the early universe and they all give values of like you know 67.4 and the tension is now easily five if not six standard deviations 
And at five standard deviations, there's only one chance in 2 million that this is just a fluke and that nature isn't trying to tell us something fundamental, okay? I mean, if you throw, I mean, right, what do I mean by a chance in 2 million? There's a chance in 2 million that the data actually agree and it just looks like they disagree to us, okay? But that's not a big chance, all right? And, and really, I would say that the, the thing is more like six sigma now. And I forgot what that is, like a chance in 10 million or something like that. So this looks really real, okay? What are the possible explanations? Well, it's still possible that we, by now, by that I mean the collective we, all, all these different techniques are wrong, okay? Or that Planck and its collective techniques are wrong. That's still possible, and that would be really boring, but possible, okay? But I'm gonna now exclude that and just say, what is it if nature really is trying to tell us something about the universe, something exciting, okay? So what, what could be going on? Well, I mean, general relativity could be wrong. That's part of the standard model. Um, you know, you take that diagram and you propagate it 13 billion years using general relativity. Well, if general relativity is wrong, then, um, you know, that would be pretty amazing. The prediction would end up being wrong from the microwave background. Um, what if dark matter is behaving weirdly and uh, interacting with light and um, causing us to be fooled with the, our measurements are explained, you know, the redshifts or something are messed up by the dark matter. I mean, that, that would be weird. Dark matter is not supposed to, in a standard picture, interact with electromagnetic radiation, all right? So that would be pretty weird. And in the standard model, it, it, it doesn't, right? Uh, what if dark energy is becoming stronger? What if we're all gonna get ripped apart in the big rip? Uh, you know, again, I don't think that's happening because there are other data that seem to argue against that, but maybe those data or the interpretations are wrong. So this is still a possibility. Um, dark energy maybe was, a, or an early form of dark energy may, maybe gave a boost to the universe. It's like, you know, you're watching some kid's soccer game and the ball goes zipping by in your myopic narrow field of view faster than any one kid could have kicked it. Well, if, what if some other kid kicked it first in the same direction? That would explain the observation, okay? Or we could live in an underdense part of the universe. And so our locally measured Hubble constant or parameter would not be representative of the larger scale universe. And again, we, I, I think that's not correct because we've measured the Hubble parameter out to like a billion light years in distance. And we're just not living, we think, in such an underdense bubble. So my own favorite right now, although I'm not a theorist and you know there are problems with this interpretation as well, but there could be a new very light subatomic particle, particle some other new species of a neutrino. This is now called dark radiation because dark matter is not what this is and dark energy is not what this is. By radiation, we mean a relativistic particle moving around really quickly. And neutrinos fit that bill. But there are other reasons we think there are only three types of neutrinos. So this would be have some weird new fourth type of neutrino called a, a sterile neutrino or something like that. So, so you know, we don't know. And, and stay tuned. Uh, I think the next decade is going to be very exciting. I think, you know, there's going to be other um, results of research that announce new interesting progress in the field. And if this tension gets stronger and stronger, then we've got a, a new revolution that in some ways I think will be as big as, or, or almost as big as the revolution of the accelerating expansion of the universe. And so uh, again, I, I pinch myself, I'm kind of at the right place at the right time. And I'm supported by generous support, you know, my undergrads, grad students, postdocs, many donors, um, including, you know, federal agencies and progressively more private foundations and individuals because the, the federal discretionary slice of the budget is becoming infinitesimally thin. And so we're relying progressively more on, on private philanthropy and stuff. Um, 
including here you can see Sylvia and Jim Katzman. But but anyway, um, I, I'm happy to uh, to take uh, an, any questions you might have at, at this point. And I've got about you know probably about 15 minutes or so because I had promised you 15 minutes of questions. But because you guys are a well recognized group of people who really know a lot of astronomy already, I thought I'd include more details than I would in say a typical public talk. But uh, yeah. So you can put them in the chat room or just unmute yourself or something uh, uh, any way that you want to uh, any way that you want to do it. And you can also, you know, you can raise your hand, I suppose, but here's something in the chat room. Um, very interesting. Thank you, Brett. Uh, but I'll open the chat room here, but you're welcome to unmute yourself or however Mark and David want to run this thing. You, you guys are the boss is it's your meeting yeah feel free to unmute yourself and speak go ahead anybody with a question don't be shy there are no no such thing so uh valerie says can you briefly explain how dark radiation solves the problem yeah uh it, it it's a little bit complicated um and the, the standard explanation that I like to give is not quite the right one. So I'll give you the standard one and then I'll try to give you the more correct one. The standard one is a little bit like this thing where I said dark, an early form of dark energy might give the universe a boost. And so the soccer ball is expanding fast, is, is moving faster than you thought it should be. So if the early universe was expanding faster than it, we thought it was, then propagating that through the calculations that have been done, well, you'll get you'll get the wrong you get the wrong prediction of what the Hubble parameter should be now if you didn't take into account this earlier than expected early expansion rate. Okay, this the fact that the the soccer ball got kicked by another kid. If you didn't take that into account, you'll get the wrong answer now. But but the more correct explanation is that the the neutrino those interacted at very early times and what that caused is the not so much of a kick that we're measuring now but it caused the early universe to expand more quickly than we thought that then leads to a different time at which this process called recombination the the, the combining for the first time ever by the way even though it's called recombination of electrons with protons with hydrogen nuclei uh, that would affect when that happened, because that happened at a certain temperature, 3000 degrees Kelvin, and that temperature was reached uh, after the universe expanded a, some amount and cooled. But if it actually in, uh, expanded faster early on because of interaction of the neutrinos, then it would have reached that temperature of 3000 degrees uh, at an earlier time than 380,000 years, and that then if you don't take that into account, affects the, the calculations. You know, you, you didn't take into account something that was a key assumption. That is that this era of recombination occurred at 380,000 years, but actually it occurred earlier. And so the sound horizon was different from what we thought. A sound wave couldn't have traveled as far as we thought it did. And that would then mean that the physical scale of these little freckles was different from what we assumed. And so then, you know, propagating forward to now, you get the wrong answer as well. So that, you know, for an astronomy group is the is the more detailed explanation of what's going on. Okay. Yeah. So uh, other uh, other questions, uh, um, you know, anything you want, you know. Uh, this is Dave Bishop. Yeah. Hi, David. I spent a little bit of time during your talk and I started looking up your supernova for you. Yeah. And Have what are you your magnitude limits? What's that? Um, I've got an 18.3 magnitude supernova called okay. 2021 WWF, hey. which is at a redshift of 0 0.27 and was just high. classified as a 1 BC. Zero, 0 0.027, presumably. 0 0.027, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, send that to me. You know my email address. Already um, sent. Great. And how young is it? When was it discovered? It was discovered on the 23rd. And 23rd. it's still rising. Great. 
Thank you. And who classified it spectroscopically, David? It was classified spectroscopically by the Presto team a few hours ago. Wow. Okay. Like I said, I get it before you do. So 0 0.027 <laughs> is a bit high redshift, but hey, beggars can't be choosy. Well, now, this, this isn't a really bright galaxy. Uh, the yeah? name of the galaxy is oh. Weiss J0 through where the okay, wait, wait, wait. You, you emailed me just now. Oh, I see your email on my on my iPhone right here. I'm going to get right on this right, right after the cocktail party is over <laughs> for the meeting I'm actually attending in Sonoma, California. It's the Sonoma Valley Authors Festival. Uh, you can look, look it up online. The, the talks will be available online. And I think you have to pay some tiny fee or something like that. But they've got amazing speakers here. You know, um, Walter Isaacson, Amy Tan, all kinds of amazing people. David Rubenstein. I mean, it's just, pardon? Uh, David Barry, right. Yeah. My wife. Well, you're a real author now, too, Alex. What's that? You're a real author now, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did a textbook, but, um, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, but hey, David, this is fantastic. Beggars can't be choosing. Now, you know, being paranoid, however, I, I will try if I trigger this thing. I'm now paranoid that because I was such a pain in the rear to the Space Telescope Science Institute this whole past week, I'm afraid they'll say, well, if it doesn't reach your anticipated magnitude limit, which is a visual magnitude of 15.5, then they won't let me trigger. But I'll have to calculate for a typical expected absolute magnitude of a type 1 BC. Maybe you can calculate this for me and email me. What do we expect the peak visual magnitude to be? Well, it's the, it's the Zalicki Transient team that discovered this animal. Yeah. Oh, great. And okay. what they I'm... do is they actually have a page yeah. which links in and puts, gives you the expected magnitude of it. So what are they expecting? I, I, by the way, I work with this wiki thing. I know Shri Kulkarni, the PI, very, very well. And, and, I, and I apologize I for everybody on the team if we're doing business here in front of them. Yeah, no, but, but this, this is, is fun stuff. Science in action, folks, okay? Um, uh, uh, David, I will owe you a beer the next time we can, or whatever you would like, next time we can get together, okay? If I end up triggering on this, on this thing or anyone that you- uh, Well, actually, I think to. this is too dim for you. Probably too dim. Damn it. Yeah. What, what's the anticipated peak? Um, according to ZTF, um, they're saying mag 17. That's not too bad. I'm in touch with Christopher Fremling, who's the principal investigator of what's called the BTS, the Bright Transient Survey. That's a subset. And it is galaxies within, I believe, 0.02 maybe 0.03. So if it's within 0.03, Christopher will know about this one. If it's within 0.02, he might not even. I'll have to go and, and look at my emails, which I haven't looked at for the past couple of hours because I've been in sessions and stuff, which is why I had to do this so late. Thank you so much for, for, um, for allowing me to speak at 8.15 Eastern time rather than seven o'clock, which I, I know was your preferred time. But um, yeah, so um, I might trigger on this thing just because I, I'm now desperate and um, we'll see how it goes, David. I'll, I'll let you know whether. Um, okay. Whether like I, I said, I think it's too dim for you and I'll keep watching. Yeah, I know, but you know, beggars can't be choosy and I'm a beggar now, basically. I might try, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Even if we don't get as good data as we were going to get on the one, I mean, um, how often do, Magnitude 15.5 type 1 BCs occur in your experience, David? A uh, couple of times a year. Right. Uh, this so year has been very exceptional. We've it's been had a happy. number of really bright ones this year. Uh, a lot of bright 1As, right? But not, yeah. a lot of, not a lot of bright 1 BCs. Not bright 1 BCs. Right. BCs. BCs, you get 1 BC for every 10 1As. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so we're now you look, get like maybe 50, you get maybe 20%. Let's call it November. Let's call it September 1st now, because for all intents and purposes, it's September 1st. We are now in the 11th hour, folks. The cycle, cycle 28 of HST um, ends September 30th. October 1st is, is cycle 29. And they won't let me defer to cycle 29, even though I try 
tied to trigger in cycle 28. So I am a beggar now. I may well trigger on this dude because All what right. are the odds that a better one will occur in the next month? You know, well, we got to let other people ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But that's, I hope they saw science in action. Okay. Other questions. Bob said, this is great. I wasn't, I'm not sure which Bob was that, but uh, you saw science in action. So yeah, either um, unmute yourself or put something. Uh, so uh, you, Bill says uh, that I gave a talk in at NEF, yes, in 2010. That's right. That was more generally on supernovae, I think. Um, yeah, but you were at NEF. That, that's right. So NEF is or was held in New York. And so there may have been several of you, you know, raise your hands if you if you were at NEF in 2010. Yeah, Brett. Yeah. Yeah. There I spoke less about cosmology, more about the different types of supernovae. Right. Yeah. Uh, OK, so Mark has their hand raised and Jim, I'm not sure if you have questions or that you were at NEF. By the way, NEF sounds a little bit like me, which is what the um, people in um, Right, um, the Knights of Neve. Right, yeah, the yeah, the night, the yeah, Mon the K, the K Knights of Neve. That's right, yeah, <laughs> in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, right? So uh, yeah, <laughs> this is Jim. We had about probably fifteen or twenty people at Neve from the club uh, and oh, talked with you endlessly in the hall afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun conference. Yeah. Other questions. I have just a few more minutes here, but happy to answer another question or two. Cocktail of choice, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually doing a star party tonight um, with, um, I don't, how, how many of you have one of these things? The Unistellar EV scope. They are interesting scope. They are amazing. They are amazing, folks, especially for star parties in the city. They do really great sky subtraction and all kinds of stuff and great for Zoom sessions. That's how I taught my classes the past year and a half, the, the star parties. If you're, they're pricey, but if you're interested, contact me. I know one of the founders of the company uh, and an order through a coupon code that I can give you will give you 250 bucks off. So alex at astro.berkeley.edu. They are pricey, 3K, but they're incredible. I bought one on the spot after one of the founders showed me in a brightly lit parking lot after one of my talks, he said, hey, Alex, come over. I wanna show you something through my telescope. I said, what could we possibly look at through your telescope you know, in, in this brightly lit parking lot that's not you know, Saturn or Jupiter or the moon? He showed me the Dumbbell Bell Nebula. I bought one, I bought the telescope on the spot. It, it is, it's a game changer. And for citizen science, if you wanna follow exoplanet transits and stuff. No single telescope data set will do this, but there are now a thousand amateur astronomers who are doing it. You add up all their light curves, they are seeing transits of not just Jupiter-sized things, but super Earths and things like that. The, the um, let me put it in here, the unistellar uh, EV scope. And there's, the, um, there's a new version too, the equinox. Uh, it's the same thing, but without an eyepiece, but you don't really need an eyepiece, but because people want an eyepiece, they're bringing back the EV scope version as well within a month or two, because some people want an eyepiece, but you run it through your iPhone or some other Android or whatever, and the images come up on your app on your phone, okay? And then, uh, and, and that's a direct Wi-Fi connection to the telescope. You could do this on Mount Everest then what you couldn't do on Mount Everest is through AT&T or Verizon, have a Zoom session where then you transmit this to um, anyone who's on your Zoom session. Uh, yeah, there are citizen science groups formed with the EV scopes. I mean, they're, they're, they're all over the place. There are the thousand people now who, and, oh, and they monitor comets and they look for killer asteroids and all kinds of other things. So if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, um, they're just amazing. Unistellar EV scope, but contact me, um, Alex at, here we go, berkeley.edu. I can get you a special deal. Great. Other um, 
questions? I don't, Jim and Mark still have their hands up. Go ahead and unmute yourselves if you have a question. Um, purists say that it's not quite the same. And I agree. The photons are not hitting your eye and your retina directly from Saturn or the Orion Nebula. They're hitting a CMOS detector. And you're looking at the image from that CMOS detector. But the, the images are out of this world and uh, they're, they're amazing. But for the purist, that's true. It's not quite the same as looking through the eyepiece. Okay, well, listen, um, yeah, what's EAA mean, Mark? <laughs> You put it in the chat room, but uh, that's 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 electronically assisted astronomy. Yeah, but for citizen science and things like that, it's it's truly amazing. Um, and so, if you want to do that, I mean, right, looking through the eyepiece, you're not getting a digital image on which you can do image analysis later on. But with the EV scope, you can take an image every like 30 seconds or something like that, and actually monitor transits. Okay, folks. Well, listen, it was a pleasure addressing you and um, have a good rest of your meeting. And I sure hope that your fest can be done in person next year. Let's all cross our fingers for that. Okay. All right. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate well, thank, it. Thank you, folks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. Well, that was fun. That was fun. Thoroughly enjoyed that. I recorded this, and I'll uh, once I get it translated, I'll put it up on our uh, on our uh, our site. So, pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Comments, questions. You can tell he's done this a few times. Yes, he knew what he was talking about. He knows exactly which words to put in where. Yeah. I'm sorry if I took over a little bit, but uh, oh. Alex asked me the question, so I figured I'd answer him. That was kind of exciting to see you guys uh, go back and forth a bit and talk about what, what was actually going on. And, hope you know, it'd be amazing if he actually used that because we could have been there when it happened. So, <laughs> No, uh, he probably will. He's uh, yeah. sent me emails like this before. You know, Dave, if you hear about something, let me know. He's not the only one. Yeah. There are others that do it. Um, but yeah, maybe it's time for me to do another show on my supernova page. That'd be, that'd be good think? because it, it could be a little, uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, intense as far as the, what, what's on there. Maybe you can kind of explain how it's used and what, uh, you know, if somebody was to look at your page, what they would, what information they would find there, how it's, how it's relevant to different, you have a lot of links and stuff there. And how it's used. Yeah. No, one thing that Alex was, was heavy on, and it's something which is very important in science today, is to make sure that you attribute where you got your information. And that's one thing that I learned early on with this site was if somebody tells me something, I don't just type the information into the page. You got to type the information into the page and a link to where you got that information. Because you want to make sure that everybody who, who spent like uh, 20 hours during the evening actually uh, gets credit for their 20 hours during the week sure. <laughs> doing this stuff. Sure. And, and uh, <clears throat> Doug Kostick, uh, you got called Ionia, huh? <laughs> that was funny. Very interesting. All right. Well, that's all I have. Um, we do have stuff coming up uh, in the next week or so. So we got observing next Saturday. We got an open house next Sunday. Uh, actually, you can go off to the site and observe any night you want. Probably best to, to if, you, if you're on the um, on the email list, let everybody know you're going out there. You can, you can probably get some company out there. If it's a clear night, you probably won't be alone. Anytime I've gone out there and not announced I'm going because I didn't plan on staying long. There's always people there. So uh, feel free to, to, to do that anytime.
but that should be uh we do have an official members observing next next saturday night and uh open house on sunday and then um we have the ionia fall festival coming up on the uh on the 18th so so it would have been nice to have had our Racha star fest surround the day as well and to finish up with this this is a great talk uh, perhaps another time and uh we did have some fun down at the site last night we had about 18 people or so come out to the site where we did um we did some barbecue beef thanks to frank both and i uh, got to chat a little bit the skies opened up a little it wasn't a clear night but we definitely were able to see some stars and i put together my little travel scope a little 10 inch scope and we actually were able to see a handful of objects up up high overhead so that was fun to do so it's good to see everybody i think we all miss being together for any length of time it's uh, it's been it's been a crazy up and down with the with what we've had to deal with with the covid all right if there's nothing else, I could talk all night and you guys can listen, or we could go on about our evening. So <laughs> thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate you being here. Have a good night. Enjoy the weekend. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark.